One of the big midterm battles playing out on Tuesday is the race for Maryland governor between Democrat Wes Moore and Republican Dan Cox. Morning Joe's chief medical correspondent, Dr. Dave Campbell, sat down with Moore to discuss his views on health care and the role of public servants in today's political landscape. What's going on, Howe County? Although never elected to public office, U.S. veteran and Rhodes Scholar Wes Moore is leading the race to become Maryland's next governor. I've been working on issues of criminal justice reform and education and early childhood and health care, but I just never run for office. I've been working in the community. I joined him on the trail to discuss the race, health care policy, and to see how he stays healthy while campaigning. Last one. Two, three, two. One, two, three. All right, all right, all right. Wes, what's the difference between you and your opponent? I very much have a leave no one behind agenda where we are going to make sure we're creating pathways for everybody in the state to be able to succeed. And I know, you know, my opponent has, uh, has proposed that he would literally criminalize abortions, all abortions, in the, uh, for both patients and providers. This is a person whose economic policies would literally slash education funding. This is a person who has no problem leaving people behind. What I would love to know is how you are going to take your concerns about those that are impoverished in the state those that have equity issues and translate that into health care policies for those that live in Maryland. One of the earliest memories I had in my life was when my father died in front of me. Um, I was almost four years old and when he went to a hospital there was assumptions about whether or not he had insurance. When my mom got to the hospital they asked her questions like, is your husband prone to exaggeration? And he was asked to leave the hospital with the instructions to get some rest and if it got worse to come back and he died in front of me hours later. I have seen the consequences of inequitable policies firsthand. I, I first felt handcuffs on my wrist when I was 11 years old. My mother didn't get her first job. I gave her benefits until I was 14. And so I know that our society and the growth of our society will be viewed not just how some are doing, but literally going to every single Marylander and going and saying that we see you. How can you pivot into healthcare services for those that have drug addiction, those that have mental health problems, consumed by the stigma that comes with those diseases of the brain. Well, and I'm, and I'm really glad that you, you phrased it that way, is because I feel like part of the challenge we've had in our society is the way we deal with mental health and the way we deal with addiction is we just criminalize it. And, you know, this is something that's very personal to me. I lost one of my best friends a couple of years ago uh, because of an overdose, and he fought. Mm -hmm. He fought to try to beat this battle. We have to do a better job of being able to add in additional healthcare mechanisms and allow people to get the treatments that they need. We need to stop the criminalization of people who are suffering from addiction. Where do you think that uh, approach starts? Everything we are seeing is a policy decision. The air we are breathing is a policy decision. The water we are drinking is a policy decision. The homes we are living in, a policy decision. The transportation assets we have, the way we are policed, the food that we have access to. These are all policy decisions. And so it's important that as, a, as policy makers, that we're then able to take that lens in the way we're talking about really creating the foundations and the supports for people to get what they need. Tell me your thoughts on patriotism. Mm. I take that word very seriously. My grandfather was the first one on my mom's side of the family born in this country. And when he was just a toddler, uh, the Ku Klux Klan ran the family out. Because uh, my great grandfather was a minister, a very vocal minister, and and started getting uh, started getting death threats, and he picked up his family and he moved, and they moved to Jamaica. And my grandfather always pledged to come back, and he did, and was maybe the most patriotic American I've ever met. I saw what patriotism looks like. I saw it when I was leading paratroopers in combat overseas, where I led paratroopers with the 82nd Airborne Division, and I refused to be lectured by an extremist election denier where my definition of patriotism was leaving my family and putting on the uniform of this country. And his definition was putting on a baseball cap and asking people to join him on January 6th. I love this country. I defend this country. I am proud of this country, even in all of its unevenness. And we will not cede that to anybody nor any political party who wants to try to bastardize the term and try to take this idea of patriotism away from those who have worked every single day of their life to make this country better. Thanks to Dr. Dave Campbell for that reporting and coming.